Hello and welcome to chapter 12 on bank management. <clears throat> really this looks at, you know, what's the basic function of a bank and uh, what kind of activities do the banks, commercial banks that is, get involved with. So, you know, the basic function of a bank is, of course, um, to be an intermediary, and that is uh, to take in money, to accept deposits of money from the general public, and to make loans. How do they make their profits then? Well, obviously the rate of interest that they pay on their deposits has to be less than the amount that they charge on the loans. So essentially their profit level is dependent on the difference between the rate of interest on the loans that they give out minus the rate of interest that they have to give to um, the depositors who are supplying those funds. And essentially what they do as well, if you look at it in terms of maturity, um, when people put money into the bank, they usually want to take it out. So that's short term assets and those short term assets, because they of necessity can be tied up for a variable amount of time short amount of time or long amount of time, depending on the preferences of the uh, depositor. But basically they tend to be rather short term uh, deposits, um, checking accounts, etc. And at the same time, the banks turn around and lend those uh, deposits out, usually for much longer terms. So this is the asset transformation that they're transforming the assets of savers, which are usually short term deposits into assets for borrowers, which are long term uh, loans, things like mortgages, you know, which can be up to 30 years and uh, other loans, which are in usually uh, uh, at least, you know, five years, three to five years. Of course, deposits um, where they get the money from don't need to be uh, have any time limit on them. In fact, most deposits are. Uh, are either savings deposits or checking deposits and um, there is no set time for those to remain within the bank. So, you know, looking at the big picture here um, in, in terms of bank management, um, there are various different types of banks. Uh, you'll probably be aware of those already. Um, certain banks are, are regulated at the federal level and certain banks are regulated at the state level. Um, so there are 51 different sets of regulators, uh, 50 because each state has its own state regulator and also there's a federal regulator as well. So uh, there are different types of banks and you know this is one of the reasons why uh, these next three chapters uh, in other countries, uh, and I've taught this course in other countries, um, we spend basically one chapter on what you're going to discuss in three chapters. The U.S. Uh, situation, the U.S. system is very complex, much more complex than any other country that I've looked at. So, um, you know, first of all, we have to distinguish between these state banks, state regulated banks and the federal regulated banks. Um, and some of these state regulated banks um, are very small and uh, they usually have assets of less than a billion dollars. Those often are called community or local banks. Um, they are banks that only have usually a few branches. Uh, we have one in Corpus that's uh, quite a big community local bank, but it is very limited in, in, in its size, and that's American Bank. Um, American Bank has only about uh, six branches, uh, and that's it. Uh, you have to contrast that, so it's a community bank, by the way, so you have to contrast that with, say, Wells Fargo or um, J.P. Morgan Chase, and uh, they have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of branches. Um, so that's the difference here. So community banks... Um, are relatively small banks. Um, so commercial banks, uh, and sometimes these larger banks like Wells Fargo and JP Morgan Chase, um, they are um, what's called money center banks. They tend to 
um, have their headquarters in money centers. Money centers meaning major financial centers. And, you know, a bank like J.P. Morgan Chase, um, it has a huge reach in the sense that it has branches in certainly the most popular states in the country, but it also has branches in other parts of the world as well. So this is an international bank. So um, the interesting thing about banks, though, is regardless of, you know, how big they are, what their reach is, etc., they all operate on the same under the same accounting rules and regulations. So what we're going to see in a second is the balance sheet for any bank, whether it's large bank or small bank. Uh, first of all, we have to look at a balance sheet and understand what a balance sheet is. I think we've already talked about that earlier in the course, but a balance sheet, if you remember, looks at the assets. Those are the things owned by the bank or owed to the bank. And then the liabilities. Those are the things that the bank owes to the general public or owes to shareholders. So a bank balance sheet summarizes the financial position of the bank at a certain time, at any time. And the bank, bank's balance sheet, like any balance sheet for any company, must balance. So if you add up all the assets, it must equal all the liabilities. Now, if we look at the liabilities, of course, on the liability side, we're going to have things like deposits, loans that the bank has taken out from maybe other banks or from the Fed. And what's left over to make it all add up, because it has to add up such that assets equal liabilities, is the net worth of the bank. So in other words, if we take the assets and the liabilities that they have, what's left is the net worth. So on the balance sheet, you always see on the left-hand side the assets, on the right-hand side the liabilities, and then the net worth. Notice that net worth is a residual here. It's calculated by taking the assets minus the liabilities, and what's left over is the value of the bank. So the bank is officially bankrupt if its liabilities exceed its assets. Then its net worth is negative, it's not worth anything, that means the shares are not worth anything, and therefore the bank is bankrupt. So what does a T look like for commercial banks? Um, the T looks very different, by the way, that for those of you who've done finance and accounting courses, you'll know that the, the, the balance sheet usually for a company has a certain uh, look to it as well. But the balance sheet for a commercial bank looks very different from uh, what you would see for a, a regular company. So let's look at the, the simplified T. Um, the assets are on the left-hand side, the liabilities are on the right-hand side. So let's go through the um, assets first of all. Um, it's cash and cash equivalents, by the way, those could be reserves as well, or those are reserves. US treasuries, municipal bonds, asset-backed securities. Um, those can be mortgage-backed securities, but that's about it. They cannot, by the way, banks, in the US cannot hold stocks. That is illegal. Loans, so that's business loans, usually called commercial and industrial loans. Real estate loans, those are usually mortgages, but they can be commercial mortgages as well. Home equity loans too. Consumer loans, these can be in the form of credit cards or auto loans or other types of loans. Uh, and then interbank loans. Interbank loans meaning the bank has lent some money to another bank. We'll look at, so that's the assets. Look at the liabilities. Checkable deposits is number one. Then any non-transaction deposits, so that's savings deposits um, and others. So like CDs would also go there, certificates of deposit. They're of course sometimes called time deposits. Borrowings from other banks, so that's through the interbank loans usually. And what's left over is, on the liability side, is bank capital. That is equal to bank capital and net worth are basically the same thing. They're, those two terms are interchangeable. So let's have a look, first of all, at um, uh, transaction deposits. Um, transaction deposits are basically uh, um, uh, checking accounts. Uh, there's a few little, um, uh, how can I put it, um, wrinkles here. 
Uh, so I'm going to explain those. But uh, basically, most banks call uh, their banks checking accounts. Now, um, there are other terms, and usually banks are trying to get around some kind of regulation, uh, perhaps in the past, perhaps presently, or else use some kind of innovative new type of uh, checking account um, that maybe has a sweep um, feature. What's a sweep feature? The sweep feature is where you have an account that uh, if you get more than a certain amount in the account, it sweeps that excess amount into some other type of account, maybe a money market deposit account or else a high interest savings account. When the amount in that account goes below a certain level, it sweeps money out of those money market deposit accounts or savings accounts back into the checking account. So those are often called sweep accounts. And sometimes they're called ATSs, so automatic transfer service accounts. Um, and uh, let's look at the other there on the now account, the negotiated order of withdrawal account. Um, there was a time back in the 1980s when banks threw some kind of uh, law that Congress passed were unable to pay over a certain amount of interest. So banks just created a new type of account. They said, OK, well, we can't call it a savings account or a deposit account. We'll just call it a now account, negotiable with order of withdrawal account. So they just got around the regulation by calling it something different. Those now accounts are still around. Um, so, you know, they often are higher interest bearing accounts. I've not seen the share draft account, but uh, uh, in any case, uh, you can look that up and see what that is. It's a different type of transaction deposit account, obviously. The commonality is that depositors can write checks on them whenever and in whatever amount they choose. So the characteristics of a demand deposit is that it has no maturity period or an original maturity period of less than seven days. So sometimes, you know, when you're depositing in a, into a, um, an account, it won't clear for three days. So the bank will keep it there. And um, it's maturity, in other words, uh, before you can pay anyone else or do anything with it, you have to wait those three business days. Some banks have up to five business days. It's payable on demand once it's uh, deposited in there and you've gone through the uh, deposit period. Um, you can make a payment to whoever you want, whenever you want, just using a check or uh, an automated um, uh, cash transfer or an ACH, as they call them these days. There's no limit on the number of withdrawals or transfers you can make, and there's no eligibility requirements. So a baby can have a demand deposit account if they want or a now account. Um, so there's no eligibility here. You don't have to have a certain amount in the account. You can have anything in that amount, in that account, as long as it's um, uh, greater than zero. So, you know, this tells you about the history of these now accounts. Regulation Q was the Banking Act of 1933. It forbade banks to pay interest on checking accounts or demand uh, deposits. And uh, Ronald Hazelton created the savings account. So it created a new type of account, which wasn't subject to Regulation Q. And that meant the withdrawal of funds at any time by writing a check on that savings account was possible as well. Um, it paid a higher rate, rate of interest. Well, it paid, you know, uh, transaction, sorry, um, checking accounts only paid zero. So this allowed people with sizable amounts in the bank to at least earn some interest on it. In the 1980s, Congress passed legislation to allow depository institutions to offer now accounts, uh, and that meant checking accounts that could pay interest. And uh, in the 1980s, um, basically, uh, um, that's when you got introduced these um, the interest uh, rates that were payable on all checking accounts as well. The amounts now payable on checking accounts is pitifully small, so. It might as well be zero, in my opinion. There's another type of account called a money market deposit account. Um, this is an interest-bearing account containing a variety of interest-bearing short-term securities. So here the bank takes your money and instead of 
lending it out to someone else in the form of a mortgage or a loan, what they do is they commit to taking your money and investing it in treasury bills. So that's um, treasury bills and commercial papers. So that's uh, uh, IOUs issued by the government and by companies that have a maturity of less than a year. Um, those do have a minimum balance requirement and there is a limit on how often the person can withdraw funds from those. Okay, so there are non-transaction accounts as well. These are what we call near monies. If you remember when we looked at the money supply, we said that you know there are money as defined by M M2, but there are also these near monies. So these are highly liquid financial assets that do not function directly or fully as a medium of exchange, but can be readily converted into currency or checkable deposits. So an example of this might be the certificates of deposit. There are liquid savings accounts for a stated length or time or term. Sometimes they're called term deposits or time deposits. Those range from 91 days, three months to 10 years. The longer the term, the higher the annual rate paid, because the longer you're tying your, your money up with the bank. Certificates of deposits. Um, they are illiquid savings accounts for stated length of time or term. You can usually withdraw money um, if you speak to the bank and arrange for that to happen, and you often suffer a penalty. And that could, those can be quite substantial if you want to withdraw money. So if you're going to use a CD, you do get a lot better rate of interest, but you have to live with the fact that you're, you won't have access to your money for a period of time. CDs require usually $1,000 to open them, and they, there are such things as jumbo CDs, which pay even higher rates of interest, and they are large time deposits of over $100,000. The major difference between those CDs and jumbo CDs, um, with the jumbo ones, you can actually negotiate the uh, interest rate instead of a stated rate. Um, the jumbo CDs can also be traded by the bank. They can trade those assets um, for if they need the cash uh, and they can trade them between each other. What about other liabilities? So we've talked about deposits of different types uh, of different liquidities, but banks can also um, raise funds via other methods such, such as federal funds purchases, um, repurchase agreements, so that's by uh, basically uh, borrowing money by using some of the assets that they have, Subordinated debt, um, that's um, debt that's being traded. Um, euro dollar contract, uh, euro dollar accounts. A euro dollar is um, essentially a dollar that is um, deposited um, out of the US, but into a dollar account. So um, US banks often offer dollar accounts in foreign countries. Um, so large banks like Chase will have dollar accounts in foreign countries. Those are called euro dollar accounts. Other borrowing and other liabilities you've seen through interbank borrowing as well. That's another possibility. So I just thought, you know, I would take JP Morgan Chase as a good example of this and pull up from the Wall Street Journal, which has the uh, balance sheets for major companies here. So you can see, you know, total deposits here and you can see how JP Morgan splits down its deposits, demand deposits, savings time deposits, foreign office deposits, which are quite sizable for a bank like JP Morgan because they're an a big international bank. You can see their debt there. So short term debt and current debt, a current portion of long term debt, current portion of long term debt, short term debt, and then long term debt. Uh, what it means by current portion of long term debt is long-term debt that's now coming due very soon. So it's basically short-term debt now. Um, so that's what that means. Um, long-term debt growth, well, these are just calculations for, for the investor to look at to see um, exactly what's going on. And that's, uh, that's kind of a sampling of the, uh, of the major um, entries in the JP Morgan balance sheet. 
Okay, I'm going to stop there and do a part two for this uh, um, chapter. Thank you.